Hello, I'm Richard Hollingham. I'm a science and space journalist and presenter of the Space Boffins podcast. Welcome to this session, Why Mars? The out-of-this-world benefits of space exploration. Uh, with three missions due to launch to Mars this summer, we're going to talk about the future of space exploration and why it matters to us here on Earth. Let me introduce our panel. We've got from Talos Alenia Space UK, the CEO, Andrew Staniland, CEO of the UK Space Agency, Graham Turnock, Will Whitehorn, President of UK Space, and Jan Werner, Director General of the European Space Agency, outgoing Director General, I should say, of the European Space Agency. Uh, Jan, if I can come to you first on this, uh, why Mars? I mean, wh what is it about Mars? Got three missions launching this summer. Sadly, not uh, a European mission, but we've got China, United Arab Emirates, uh, the United States. What's the attraction of Mars? First of all, why not? Hi, Richard. So, yes, and uh, outgoing is a little bit exaggerating. I still have another year and I'm not stopping before that, so I will do a lot what I can do. So why, why Mars? Uh, so it's really, uh, from my perspective, there are three main reasons. Uh, number one, we do this to understand a planet. Mars had an, a system very close to the Earth, a better atmosphere, better temperature than now, etc. So we can learn a lot from, from Mars. Number two is also technology development. Whatever we do for exploration, the technologies, they are used afterwards also uncrowned. And the third thing is for me the most important one. And this is humankind is driven by curiosity. Whether we like it or not, it is like that. And therefore, when people see what we are doing in space, they are fascinated. That's all the time the case. And that is good. Fascination is a positive mood in our brain, much better than all these coronavirus things, etc. So therefore... It is positive. Fascination is positive. Out of fascination, you can get inspiration. That means you are really thinking about what, what is fascinating. And the next and the final step is then to be motivated to do something also coming from dreams. So therefore, Mars is delivering all of this. And Mars is very special because we still expect something to find there, something like life. Yeah, and that you've set the tone really nicely for the discussion. Uh, Graham, though, if I could come to you, how frustrating is it that we, we've not got this uh, ExoMars rover built, uh, constructed in the UK, launching launching this summer? Obviously, it's it's really disappointing. Um, so many people worked so hard to put together the uh, Rosalind Franklin rover uh, and get it ready for launch that not being able to do it is obviously, you know, a real shame. Uh, but obviously, combination of COVID and then some really challenging technical um, issues, which we just didn't feel in the end we had time to resolve, not least given the COVID uh, situation meant that uh, in this case, uh, the best option was just to say, let's go again in two years time. I mean, the problem with Mars is that you really have a launch window that's fairly short and only exists for two years. And that's because um, Mars and the Earth have um, a rotational periods around the sun that don't quite match, but they come together every two years. So you want to make the jump to Mars when the two planets are closest together. So we are going to have to wait for a couple of years, um, but we'll be really on the edge of uh, our seats and looking forward to doing that uh, when the time comes. Uh, this is a perfect place to bring uh, Andrew in uh, because uh, Talos Alenia Space UK worked on some of the subsystems for, for the Mars uh, rover. I mean, what is, what's been the benefit, uh, as you see it, to to us on Earth of, of building this? I mean, is it is it more than let's do this and create some jobs in doing it? I mean, are there wider benefits? Uh, yeah, I mean, that that's obviously uh, interesting to companies like, like mine. Uh, I won't lie, but uh, you know, for, for us, it, companies like ours need a mission. They need a purpose. They need something to get the whole the whole workforce behind. And exploration is one of those one of those things. And you know, it doesn't matter how old you are or how how long your career is. When somebody says we're doing something to go to Mars, you wake up. And you know, certainly from from that perspective, it's really important for a company like Taz or anybody in the space industry that you have this this kind of mission in your portfolio. Uh, in terms of you know, why, why this particular mission, you know, it's, there's lots of reasons. Like it, the collaboration that's involved in, in ExoMars is really interesting. So it's not just TAS, it's, it's TAS and, and Airbus as well. Our, 
you know, normally one of our competitors, but on this we're we're very strong partners. And partnership with uh, with Roscosmos and and the Russian space industry is really really valuable to us in all sorts of ways going forward. Uh, Will does that help having this a big idea a big mission? I mean, you know, you, you've been around in the uh, in the space industry for for quite a while. You you started off with uh, uh, it, you know most best known with uh, with Virgin Galactic. I mean, that's a that's a big mission to get tourists into space. Does, does that mission led really help in terms of of, of generating what well, business, but also generating fascination for space? I mean, funnily enough, I still feel like the new kid on the block when it comes to space. Um, I was interested in space from childhood, but I had never worked in the space industry before Virgin Galactic. And my interest in space really stems from, I suppose, science fiction. And I think it's one of the reasons why missions to Mars have always been at the top of the list. If you think about it, the late Victorians actually believed that Mars was inhabited. They believed they saw the canals. They believed they saw evidence of life. Well, they might have seen evidence of some sort of life, but we don't know what sort yet. But they believed that. It was no coincidence that HGL's War of the World was an invasion from Mars. It's no coincidence that the first modern science fiction film in the 1950s, The Forbidden Planet, first one in colour, where they actually lose you know, laser guns and such like, is set on Mars. It's no coincidence that a lot of what goes on in 2001, A Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick's great film, relates to events that happen in the outer planets, Mars being the first one where these events take place. And it's no coincidence that the commercial flight has begun in Stanley Kubrick's vision. What none of those people understood was the economics of getting to Mars. These are the economics for governments, which is tricky enough, but the economics commercially, which make the idea of taking people to Mars in the modern era, very far-fetched. So a whole, whole, whole generation began to grow up thinking it's too difficult. They saw the problems of the space shuttle. They kind of got slightly disillusioned. But we're now in a generation who don't feel like that. They feel that the world is their oyster from the point of view of space because they're seeing things like Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit. They're seeing SpaceX do amazing things. They're seeing Elon Musk actually building rockets capable of taking humans to Mars. So therefore, the science has suddenly become much more interesting to a much wider public over the past seven or eight years, especially the tantalizing idea that actually that particular space rock might show evidence of a microbe. There is evidence of water. There's evidence of other gases. There's evidence of methane. So slowly the picture begins to build that the idea of habitating Mars in some way by humans is possible. As Jan said at the beginning, um, one of the things that's exciting about Mars is the very fact that it has an atmosphere that one time we know in the past it had a viable atmosphere from what we can tell at the moment. And the more we know about that, the more we'll know about our own planet and what's going to happen there. But I think overriding, if you take the sort of socioeconomic context of Mars, people are excited about it again. And that's why science missions there are in the public eye. And that's why I think there will be manned missions to Mars and there will possibly be commercial missions to Mars. I think Elon's pipe dream of 10 years ago is moving towards a pipe possible reality. Well, we could pick up on that a, a, a bit later. I mean, Jan, do you think we obsess a little bit sometimes, particularly with the, the space industry, and uh, maybe particularly in the UK, about the economic benefits of space, as opposed to the, the big vision, which brings economic benefits? That's an interesting question, Richard. Uh, we made all this uh, evaluation of the commercial benefit of emissions, and we found out that overall space has a factor of one to six, meaning one pound invested leads to six uh, pound return. One to six. Now we look to different missions and people say, ah, that's, that's overall, but why to go for, for Mars or something like that when we have COVID problems on Earth? And I believe this is a very totally wrong and stupid reaction. Even in exploration, we could show that the direct return of investment is one to two. So therefore, one, one euro or pound invested gets the two times uh, the, the benefit back. So there is a benefit. And I must say, I'm not so happy about all of these discussions, which are mainly coming from politicians. 
the normal people, the people whom I really think are more important, the normal people, they don't worry about it. We asked them, we made a big survey, and they said, yes, go for a space, go for a moon, go for Mars. So people are really looking into that as a vision or as a positive vision for humankind, and not just as a question whether the, the euro or the pound is invested well. It is invested well, but this is not the point. I'd like to come on to the International Space Station because we're, we're reaching a significant uh, anniversary uh, this year. Uh, 20 years of continuous occupation of the space station in November. Uh, I was there at the first stage uh, of the it's International the Space Station of the ISS being launched, the Zarya module from oh. Baikonur in uh, 1998. I was one of only two uh, Western journalists uh, there uh, at the launch. Uh, I can tell you stories about that, but uh, yeah. this is not the time. Uh, uh, Graham, I wanted to come on to you because it's interesting that the UK and the and the ISS. I think you know the UK was a signatory to the to the agreement that put the ISS up, uh, and then pretty much dropped dropped out and took a back seat, and now back back on board with it. I mean, what, what's the reasoning behind that? Yeah, so for a very long time in the UK, there was um, I think really you would say a sort of bar on investing in human spaceflight. I mean, at that stage, our investment in space wasn't that high anyway. And the Treasury, I think, saw this as being a very expensive thing to do and didn't necessarily play to our strengths, which uh, as a country were more in areas like communication satellites. So it wasn't until then, you know, in the late sort of 2000s, um, just around the time that we started to think about really boosting the UK's space sector, we were seeing companies like, um, sorry, satellites, you know, being very innovative with small satellites, that, that the idea really of um, investing in, in space um, and supporting the International Space Station came back to the fore. And it was very much in the context of really supporting, you know, STEM education, providing inspiration um, for children. And of course, about the same time, Tim Peake had applied himself to become an astronaut independently of the UK at that time. Of course, we'd had Helen Sharman as our first astronaut many years before, but that was through a private venture. So, so, uh, and then I suppose another key ingredient was that um, the um, European Space Agency, uh, you know, were very um, uh, positive about our participating in their exploration program. And they were and, and they recognized that our industry wasn't really aligned to human exploration, but they were happy for us to take a big role in robotic exploration. We've just been talking about the Mars rover. Uh, and in return, you know, we could have astronauts on the space station. So we, we came to a sort of sensible arrangement, um, which really meant that I suppose from a UK perspective, we got the best of all worlds. We got an astronaut through Tim on the ISS. And we also got to do exciting things uh, with the Mars rover uh, and other exploration activities. So has that worked out for the UK, pushing more towards that, you know, human exploration, if you like, rather than just being involved in, I would say just, but you know what I mean, uh, satellite missions or, or robotic exploration? Well, I think so. I definitely. I mean, if you look at the impact that Tim's flight had on um, uh, school children, it was just amazing. So. You know, we backed it up with a big program of experiments and communications and just engaging the school children in, in Tim's flight. And uh, we reached well over two million school children in that. So just imagine if every one of those school children went on to study STEM at university. Wouldn't that be absolutely amazing? And I'm convinced that many of them will be studying STEM purely as, as a result of Tim's mission. Uh, and Will, I mean, is there a... a are we moving towards you mentioned Elon Musk before and and there are these this private ventures into exploration which was traditionally really the role of the space agencies well i think it's very important and it comes back to something graham said um there is no argument you could put to the treasury in particular for human exploration of space because human exploration of space isn't strictly, in pure scientific terms, 100% necessary. However, if you look at society as a whole, um, people aren't that interested in robots going to space. They want to know what human beings are doing, and they want to dream. You know, they want to dream about taking us somewhere else. Humanity's always had that. We know that. If you look at human history, since we could write, we were looking at the stars. And we were dreaming of the stars and we were dreaming about going beyond where we were, be it, you know, crossing oceans 
in sailing ships, navigating the world, going to the depths of the ocean, or going into space. The argument for it is the one about education, is the one about, um, you know, society as a whole having to have some kind of goals, or society really isn't society. So I would make a strong case that something like Virgin Galactic is important. Um, if, they, if, if, if space tourism takes off, it gives people an understanding of the planet around them. You know, it was those human beings on the Apollo who first looked back and saw that blue planet who inspired really the environmental cause of the 19, late 1960s all the way through. You know, environmentalism until then had been a bit about Silent Spring and the hopelessness, whereas when the, the idea of the planet was seen by human beings and they talked about it, um, I'm thinking of, you know, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins and their predecessors on the earlier Apollo missions, all were, were in wonder at the planet. And if it hadn't been for those human beings here, I am sure the, the movement would have been different. Can I, sorry to interrupt, yeah, go, go on then, I'll, I've got a if question. If it hadn't been for the need to take those humans to space in the way they were taken, many of the technological advances that were that one to six that Jan talked about wouldn't have happened because you'd have only been taking early computerized technology to the moon. You'd never have taken people, you'd never have developed Velcro, you'd never have developed a whole host of other products that went alongside the computers that were developed. And the computers capable of being used by people in the way that they were. These things were really important. They were what led to Silicon Valley. So humanity going to space and exploring doesn't need a pure economic case. It needs a societal case. Now, I mean, Graham talked uh, about Tim Peake and I mean, the, the extraordinary work he's done, but all the astronauts do. And I think European astronauts, I might be slightly biased here, but I think European astronauts have done a particularly good job in that communication. And we feel like we're there. They've done all they've done all that. Is there a danger, though, if we move towards private expeditions to space of people? that we we lose that and it just becomes the preserve of, of of the super rich if you like and we don't get to experience it th it through them in the same way that we do if an astronaut like tim peake goes up or samantha christopheretti goes up i mean i'll answer that very quickly first in the case of virgin galactic when i was president of it until 2010 when and when george took over they have created a project around that where they're going to take people for nothing they're younger people and they have they've already had three competitions some of them are going to be quite old by the time they actually fly with the length of time it's taken but that's life in space you know it's not easy but the fact is, is that you're right there's an issue there and that's an issue that has to be resolved and people like elon musk have to realize that if they are going to offer tickets to mars they've got to be tickets to mars whereby there's some kind of balloting where the rich bring the the, the, the less able to afford it but you create some kind of structure that allows access to space, even in the private sector, not based purely on money. I know that that's one of the principles that the Virgin's working to with their project. I don't know what Elon's, Elon's principles are going to be, but I think he is actually considering that at the moment. Andrew, uh, let's come back to the uh, to the ISS. Just in technical terms, Talisalenia Space has done, uh, I think I was reading on your website, 40% of the space station, something, some substantial amount uh, of, of work on uh, on the ISS. So there is a direct, obviously, direct economic benefit. But is there a, a technological benefit? Have we, what have we learned in in technological terms from, from the, that work on the ISS? I think, uh, well, so they... I can't speak for science that's done on the space station. I mean, we can we can all talk about the bits that are interesting to us, but from from a company perspective, it's a different beast. You know, having launching stuff that goes into space, uh, telecom satellites where I spent most of my career, or Earth observation satellites. You know, there's there's a a known path of making sure the technology is going to work, making sure it's reliable. Uh, then you sit it on a firework and cross your fingers. When you start to think about putting a human being inside that technology, uh, we've done, I, I think it's you know, somewhere between 40, 50 percent of the pressurized um, habitats on the space station. That's that's a different challenge that that raises your individual level of responsibility of the work that you do day to day. And uh, it's not my part of, of Talazalinia space, but I would argue that 
going through that process of the last 20 years of being part of uh, uh, part of the growth of the space station, learning what it means to have people's lives in your hands, your technology's hands, has almost certainly benefited us in all the other adventures that we do uh, across across Taz's ventures and and possibly into into our parents, into Talis and the other the other aspects of engineering. You know, it's just a different mindset. And you know, to parrot back what some of the other guys have said, it's inspiring to everybody. You know, Tim Peake has visited, you know, he opened our site in Belfast before I joined the company. He's met some of the people that I now manage. They are all inspired by him, all of them, from people who are straight out of university to people who've been in the space industry 30, 40 years. You know, having your own astronaut is something that you cannot put a price on. Uh, Jan, I wanted to come up to the other key aspect of the International Space Station, the international aspect of it, because it is interesting that the, the inter- it's almost as if I've traveled to, to Russia many times. I've commentated on launches to the space station. It, it's almost as if all the animosities we have on a, on a daily basis in politics are kind of left at the uh, at the front door, if you like, of, of the ISS, certainly on board. But also, I mean, I've noticed that on the ground as well. I'm sure it's not entirely the case, but it, it is quite a, it's, it's quite a beacon of, of showing that countries that don't get on can get on. Yeah, you're right. In 2014, I was invited to go to Baikonur to see the launch of a European astronaut, in that case with a German passport or German driver license. But anyhow, that was the nationality was not the important thing. I went there and it was just at the beginning of the Crimea conflict. You all remember what happened. Um, and there were sanctions from many countries, also from the European Union, and there are still sanctions vis-a-vis uh, the, the Russia and uh, I was very afraid going to Baikonur, sending a European astronaut uh, in space together with a Russian cosmonaut and an American astronaut. Will that work or will that not work? So I, I arrived in Baikonur and my first picture, which I shot with my camera, was really, it's still my beloved picture. It shows uh, the three astronauts, cosmonauts sitting close together, not as close as in the Soyuz capsule, but sitting close together. And there was no politics, but nothing, just nothing. And uh, the Russians also asked me to give some words to the state commission. What is uh, the state commission is always before a launch. They have an official meeting where each and everybody is saying whether it's, uh, they are ready for launch. And I could give a speech there. And also the American colleague could give a speech. And there I thought really, yes, this world is not uh, is not gone. We still can work on it. We still go, can go for globalization uh, for humankind. So geopolitical aspects are, of course, of, of course, of utmost importance. So this is the only point where I'm a little bit, let's say, nervous uh, with all these different activities worldwide and the words to say American uh, astronaut, with an American launcher from American ground. So I hope that we have also in the future uh, all these different nations together in launching and in, in space stations. And therefore, ESA is a very nice model for that. We have already 22 countries within one organization, and therefore we are role model for also for the future of cooperating in space. And you've also had astronauts training with Chinese uh, Taikonauts. So is that a way forward, do you think? And how do, would you resolve that with U.S. relations. I mean, ca- could realistically you have a space station with Chinese, Russian and Europeans? No, probably. I believe, yes, we can. Uh, I was trying very hard uh, and I did not succeed that the uh, Chinese did not go for their own uh, space station. I was always asking so that they should should join also in the ISS. And there was an interesting point uh, shortly after Obama came into his position there was an Augustine commission, a commission which should uh, deliver a report to the president to say, what is the future in space? And they asked me, what about ISS? And I said, ah, we should open the hatches. I mean, not not to get... Uh, <laughs> not literally. <laughs> uh, but you understand what I mean. So we should open the hatches for India and China. And it was very quiet. It was a telephone interview. It was very quiet in that moment. And they asked again, can you repeat? We did not get the last word. I said, yeah, it was China. Uh, And I'm really uh, optimistic that we can work together. So ESA is still working together with East and West. Uh, We have also, we are part of one of their Mars mission, which will be launched in a few days. We have the ESA logo even uh, on the the launcher. 
So therefore, we are working together with East and West. We are also part of the NASA mission. So I think in, uh, ESA has a very important uh, play to, uh, in this uh, very political game. Uh, Graham, I'm going to ask you about China. I suspect you'll give a very diplomatic answer. Uh, sorry, what's your question then? <laughs> so my question is, could could the UK, I mean, as a member of ESA, work work with China? I mean, you know, British we companies do are. work with ESA, with China, don't they? Yeah, well, we already are. So we've, we've got a mission that we're very much involved in through ESA called SMILE, which is looking at uh, the solar uh, so the weather and solar um, solar impacts on the earth. So yeah, we're very much working with China, um, and we've also got a very um, substantial program of academic and educational uh, exchanges with them. So yeah, don't believe everything you read in the papers, Richard. <laughs> As if, uh, Will. Um, you know, uh, in terms of you know this this collaboration, cooperation in space. Do you see that translating back down? down to earth? Because, I mean, you've worked in the US, you, you've worked here, you, you've got a, a sense of, of how these countries work together in space. I have. And, you know, it is not a great prospect going forward if the trends continue that have, you know, taken hold over the past couple of years. I think that it, we really need to concentrate on trying to internationalise some projects at a government level where cooperation is clearly needed because there is not the resource in one nation state. Mars, of course, that represents a planetary expeditionary um, goal, which should require global cooperation, especially if we we're going to take people to Mars. In addition to the commercial aspects of it, my reckoning is that the reality of a manned Mars mission is it's going to have to be a combination of multiple states and multiple private enterprise brought together in a single mission. Because you're talking about the real costs of doing, you know, human human survival on Mars is possible. It's not possible on other planets. It might be possible on one or two moons, but it's it's fundamentally not possible on most of the most of the other moons or planets. But it is possible on Mars. And therefore if we were going to send a manned mission that was going to establish something on Mars, which is again a possibility, it's going to have to be global. Because the cost, we are in the hundreds of billions eventually by the time you've actually taken people and sustained life there. And I hope that that is where the world would come together and the private and the public sector would come together. And you get the likes of the Elons of this world, the Jeff Bezos, the Richard Bransons, working with you know multiple organizations like ESA, NASA, our friends in Australia and you know Japan and China, India. Russia, you know, and treat it as 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 a as an expedition for humanity. Now, so, the so in, happening are not I, high. So, in terms of that, we've almost got to. Are we missing a trick here in translating some of this cooperation we're seeing in space, whether that's industry or, as Graham mentioned, working with China, with the cooperation on the International Space Station? Are, are we missing a trick in in trying to translate some of that back down to Earth and saying, "Well, look, it works here. Why wouldn't it work here?" That's, that is the hardest question of the moment. You have to remember that we have been through a phase, um, even during the Cold War, international cooperation improved because of the fear of nuclear Armageddon. In the post-Cold War period, international cooperation generally improved at all levels, not just um, at treaty levels regarding access to all sorts of technologies and all the rest of it. We have definitely had a turn a very sharp turn. And as to whose fault that is, uh, from one side of our planet to the other, the debate on that is still ongoing. But the fact is that's happened. I do think, though, that space is one of the few areas where we can try and hold something together over the next 20 years. And that's why all of us who work in space have to bear that in mind. But at the same time, when you've got state actors out there experimenting with ways of destroying assets in space, You've also got to think about defending them. And, you know, that is the two edged sword of keeping freedom and democracy alive, as they've said since 1945. Well, let's pull it back a little bit from uh, from geopolitics and talk about the, the next step, if you like, or the next giant leap, which is this idea of a return to the moon or well, more than an idea. 
you know, a mission to return to the moon. Uh, and Andrew, I mean, you know, are you excited about this? Because again, Talos Alenia Space are, are pretty heavily involved in in these in these missions. Uh, I am excited. I mean, I'm uh, just old enough to have uh, been around when the last moon landing was on. Uh, and, you know, it staggers me that after 12 people walked on the moon, the planet got bored. I, yeah, I, I can't even imagine it. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited about it. You know, we are involved um, on a couple of these emissions for the, the Lunar Gateway. Uh, and we're involved in the UK um, doing some of the refueling for that, that system. So I think uh, there's lots of debate whether the moon is a stepping stone, whether we should leapfrog the moon and go straight to Mars. I think there's a lot of unfinished business with the moon. You know, maybe maybe not the science argument is as strong as it is for Mars. Mm. But certainly the inspiration argument, I would argue, for people around my age who, who missed the lunar landings, it's still you know very exciting. My little boy's just turned five, and he knows all the Apollo astronauts already. So you know, I think. There's still an inspirational argument for the moon. I think there's still an argument for technology development on the moon. Um, I was listening to one of the Apollo podcasts the other day, and we we tend to forget that the moon is deep space because we see it every day. We think it's as simple as the uh, space station, and it's not. And I think yeah, some of industry has forgotten how hard it is, and some of industries never learned how hard it is. So for me, I'm very excited. Our company's very excited to be part of it. Uh, and I can't wait for it to happen. And Graham, this is a bit of a change. You know, the, the UK taking a back seat on the ISS, but the UK very much involved in in pushing to re- return to the moon. Yeah, no, as, as Andrew says, I think the moon is is naturally the first place to try and solve some really important challenges if we want to go on to other planets after that. So, you know, to, to sustain life beyond a limited period, you're going to need access to water, and then you're going to need to crack water to get oxygen. And, you know, the opportunities to develop technologies and solutions that exist on the moon, because we know that there's there's ice there. I mean, also, clearly, once you move out of the Earth's low Earth orbit, you're exposed to radiation. So, again, a mission to Mars would expose astronauts to uh, lengthy periods of um, uh, cosmic irradiation. So going to the moon is a good place to test. Um, a period of time um, uh, with that kind of challenge and and very much a UK area of interest. So, you know, both uh, in terms of the commercial space sector, which was so strong in the UK and our institutional interest. So a company called Spacebit um, announced that it was going to put a lander on the moon itself, um, a commercial venture um, last um, autumn and really excited to see how they get on. Um, and then obviously within the context of our membership of the European uh, exploration program. We're very much looking to be part of uh, Europe's contribution to going back to the moon, working on the deep space gateway, potentially providing again um, key, key capabilities that we have in the UK, like communications, um, uh, to support that. Uh, Jan, um, when you first became Director General, uh, I sat down with you and interviewed you about the, the Moon Village, which I wrote up for, for BBC Future, one of our most popular articles at the time, actually. Uh, this Moon Village, this visionary idea, I mean, is that still possible? Is that something you, you, would, still, you would still talk about? Because, again, it embodies this idea of spirit of cooperation, and a little different to just a, a scientific base or a kind of get there, grab some stuff and come back. Yeah. So the vision of the moon village is gone. It's reality now. That's that's the point. So you see, I'm also against uh, going back to the moon or return to the moon. I'm strongly against that. Uh, why? Because I think we should not copy what was done 50 years ago in race in space. We should this time we should go there together um, on a on a on a international. Uh, basis, but also commercial and private uh, and commercial and public as well. And therefore, I always say, let's go not go back to the moon, as the Americans are saying. Let's go forward to the moon. That's a tiny word difference, but from the contents is quite uh, difficult, uh, uh, quite big. And therefore, the moon village is really not any longer a vision because all these ideas of going there with a the gateway, going there to the surface of the moon together. This is exactly what I meant when I, uh, when I said, let's have a moon village. And I was really happy that after I promoted this moon village, the American, Jeff Bezos, well, of course, the Americans are always a little bit bigger. He was talking about a city on the moon. Excellent. 
and uh, Musk was taking, uh, let's have a moon-based moon alpha, uh, and everybody knows what that means. So he always was, was suddenly talking about the moon, so I was really happy about that. And uh, also I would like to say from a scientific point of view, the moon is still very, very interesting. It's not gone. I, when I started to discuss about the moon, the scientist told me, Jan, why do you say that? The moon is just a dead stone. Don't go there. But now we know, as uh, Karen was saying, we know that there is water. We know that there are some special minerals. We know that we can learn there also to build structures with uh, the, the resources we find in situ. We can have an observatory on the far side of the moon to have a deep look into the universe. So the moon is, from a scientific point of view, very interesting, from a technological point of view, uh, very interesting and of course also from inspiration so i think really the moon is our next destination and then go on to mars uh, it's really interesting you say that about the americans saying going back to the moon uh, uh it's it's tricky isn't it with this because your moon village idea really broke through and it broke through internationally how do you get some of the narrative? Because, I mean, you know, the missions to the moon, the Orion project to go to the moon, the Lunar Gateway, that involves European partners. But if you look at, you know, some of the American websites, you'd have no idea that that's the case. Yeah, so uh, Jim Friedenstein is talking about going forward to the moon. He already copied it. <laughs> and I had a talk with, uh, with Pence, uh, the vice president. I, I told him, Mr. Vice President, I know vice presidents never make mistakes. But I would offer you and I would really argue and recommend you not to talk about back to the moon. You don't want to copy the past. You want to be positive for the future. So please talk about forward to the moon. And he said, yes, I will do. But so far, I did not hear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so, Will, Will, what's your take on this? Um, I, I completely agree with Jan and Graham. The moon is a glorious opportunity to learn what needs to be done to go to Mars and beyond if we're going to take humanity out into the solar system and beyond it. Um, the moon is deep space. It's not easy. We shouldn't be trying to repeat what was done in 19, you know, the late 1960s and early 1970s with the Apollo missions. We should be looking at it as, as a, a private, public, international venture. We should be looking at minerals, for example. One of the ones that intrigues me, and Jan might be able to tell me if, 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 if so much that I've read about it is probably barking up the wrong tree, as we say in Britain. Helium-3. Tell me a bit about helium-3. Can I be interviewer for a sec here, Richard, and just ask? <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah, because that's a very good, the very good question. Helium-3 yeah. might be interesting to the audience, some of whom won't know much about it. Tell us about helium-3, helium uh, Jan. So there is helium-3 on, on moon. Fine. It's a fact. But to go there and to get the helium-3 back to Earth, this is just nonsense because you get it cheaper over here. So therefore, this, this is maybe in 100 years' time when we fly much cheaper to the moon, then it makes some sense. Of course, helium-3 has several applications on Earth, and therefore, especially the Chinese are always arguing with that. Uh, but from our, com from our calculation, it does not make sense, even if we can reduce the transportation costs by a factor of five or even more. So this is future. But why not think about the future? First, let's use the material which is over there for purpose over there. For instance, to use the regolith to build structures, shelters for uh, astronauts. Uh, it was also Graham who mentioned the radiation. So therefore, this is much more important to build shelters over there for the people and don't bring the stuff from Earth to the moon because that's too expensive. Last time, the astronauts did not only bring things over there, but also their, their waste, their personal waste as well, is still on the surface of the moon. Next time, we should be a little bit environmentally friendly also on the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, we can pick up on that. I'm not, we're not going to have a discussion on the human waste on the moon, but it's going to be yeah. very interesting to bring that back to Earth and see if any uh, bacteria or anything is uh, is still alive in you, that. You know, I can pick up, waste. you know that there's a special story from uh, Apollo 12. Apollo 12, um, the, the astronauts landed close to an earlier spacecraft. So I think it was Surveyor 12. Yes, one of the, one of, you're right. Surveyor, one of, one two, of the Surveyor 2 or something. Probes, yeah. I don't know exactly now. And they took a camera from there and brought it back to Earth. And then they investigated this camera and they found some bacteria. And they said, oh, there are bacteria on the surface of the moon. But it wasn't. It was a technician who had a coat. 
<laughs> well, I, I'm very interested in uh, in finding out about astronaut waste after 50 years uh, on the moon. <laughs> uh, but let's let's get let's get back to the, the subject. I mean, Andrew, are there commercial opportunities uh, here? I mean, is is this a rather than a public endeavour, can this be a, a realistic public-private endeavour with, with economic benefits? Uh, well, I think that, they're, well, firstly, I think yes. And secondly, I think there has to be. I mean, you're already seeing commercial enterprises enter, I don't want to use the word space race after we just debunked it, but in, entering the space environment. You know, the, uh, we entered a, an agreement recently with a company called Axiom, who uh, their ambition is to have the first commercial space station. So going to they're going to help build um, um, pods for the current space station then when the ISS retires it'll be a commercial space station I think the the lunar communications that Graham mentioned there's every chance that that will end up being a commercial venture rather than funded by government and you know we're hoping to be part of some of those discussions in, in the early phases and, and on into the future so yeah I think that's People in business don't go and do something unless there's a return. And even if you can't see the return right now, I think there will be in the future. And the moon is very key to that, you know, solving some of those problems, getting people involved in real technological challenges has so many knock on benefits economically. And I think you've seen during the last few months, quite a few of the space companies were involved in the COVID response, not just in the UK, but across the world. And that's because we tend to employ people who can put their brains at all sorts of different problems. And you know, there is, if you could quantify how many people who have worked in the space industry or are now in other industries, bringing that expertise that they've learned in harsh environments into more earthly problems, you know, robotics, autonomy, AI, um, agriculture, you know, things like that. I think you, you would find that there is a lot of money to be made in the uh, private sector from space. And there, there will continue to be. Graham, you must be, uh, you know, heartened at the interest in not just this government, but successive uh, previous governments and successive governments really over the last 10, 15 years in in the UK in in space and putting money into the space sector, whether that's for the International Space Station or, or satellites or, or seed funding for commercial operations. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, we've just seen very recently that the government's invested in um you know, supporting the continued operations of OneWeb, a really exciting um, communication satellite company in the UK um, with several hundred million dollars um, to enable that company to continue to operate. So, yeah, I get a very strong sense from the centre of government, really from Prime Minister downwards, that space is a, a big priority, that, you know, they can see the massive uh, benefits to the UK both in terms of science and the economy, but also um, more importantly now, going forward, thinking about national capabilities uh, that space can provide us with and support us with, you know, whether that's, you know, on the security side of things or indeed protecting us against natural um, uh, challenges such as climate change or even helping address climate change or even helping in our humanitarian work in a disaster recovery around the world. So there's real sense of space as being a tool to help us uh, live a life better here on Earth, not just bad exploration. Uh, and what about um, another uh, astronaut mission, either Tim Peake returning or, or continued support for humans in space from the UK? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. So um, uh, uh, it was confirmed at the most recent uh, ministerial meeting of ESA uh, in the uh, autumn that uh, the uh, astronauts that uh, uh, Tim is part of, that his cohort will be um, going back for another um, trip to the space station. So we're really looking forward to um, Tim, Tim making another um, uh, journey into space. So uh, and we will obviously be looking to support him and really, again, you know, draw the massive benefits from that for, uh, for STEM. Uh, I want to, though, to, uh, put the other point of view, Jan, uh, on this. You know, you've got a, you've got a Tim Peake, but with, for example, Rosetta and the Philae Lander, we almost have the equivalent of a robotic Tim Peake, you know, it became this, it almost felt like we had a representative there on the comet. It was almost as if there was a person there. Can we not do a lot of this with robotic technology? Yeah, of course, we're always trying to have a narrative. This is very important. It's beyond all the technical aspects and uh, all the medical uh, experiments we do on ISS. It's a narrative, to have a narrative. Why are we doing it? And you're right. 
with Rosetta, we tried successfully to make it more personal, to make it close to a human. So also the main spacecraft and then the, the lander to make them mother and son or mother and daughter. So to have a story, a narrative about it. But at the end, it's it's a difference. You see, for instance, if you see pictures, very nice pictures from uh, from Earth, um, from a satellite, uh, these pictures are impressive. But if you see the same picture, more or less the same picture, made by an astronaut and giving this picture a soul, I say. Uh, so, for instance, um, Samantha Cristoforetti showing the, the, the Earth and the thin, very thin atmosphere around the Earth. Then suddenly you feel that this ambassadorship of the astronauts gets into our brain. So I think we should not say either or. We should combine them in the future. So robotics and human exploration belongs together. We have right now also artificial intelligence on board of the ISS helping the astronauts and the other way around. So I think really both together, that makes sense. Uh, we should, and by the way, whenever I was asked uh, why, to, why are you still doing uh, astronauts uh, in, in space, and if the, the discussion goes really to the very end and I have no further argument, I say, okay, please measure the blood pressure of a robot. If that helps you, then we will send only robots also for medical uh, examinations in space because this is bullshit. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, let's have some big thoughts to uh, to, uh, to end on. Um, uh, Graham, I mean, how do you see? Uh, I mean, I think talk about the, the UK really, the future of the, of the UK in, in space exploration in, in its broadest sense. Yeah, so I mean, I think we should obviously, as we've just discussed, you know, we need to keep behind Tim, and I'm sure there'll be somebody to follow on from Tim in human exploration, but. Um, the really big, exciting project that we're starting to work on now would be bringing um, samples back from Mars. So, you know, we've got a lead role in, in ESA's next really exciting project on that. And um, already Airbus and, Steve, and Stevenage um, are doing some fantastic design work on what, uh, what that robot would look like that would actually take a sample of Mars, Earth and bring it back to uh, the world. And would be exciting if that actually contained the life form. Uh, so yeah, that's what I would uh, I would be looking forward to in the next fifteen years, bringing back some life on Mars to Earth. Andrew, uh, so for me, I think the the future is really exciting. You know, the, the human aspect that we talked about the last hour has been, you know, it, it, it never ceases to inspiring. And to, to Jan's point, when when a robot is playing space oddity on the space station and everybody's going wow, then great, I'll I'll be excited too. But you don't get that unless it's a human being. Uh, I think for me, what I'm looking for out of the next the next decade or so is is just to get some of the excitement back into the industry. I think you know we, we tend to forget that the Apollo missions, the average age of the guys in mission control was 26 or 27, and they were interested with the whole mission. And nowadays, it's you know I'm not one of the new guys anymore in the industry. You know how do we get that level of excitement back into the industry? with people taking genuine risk to do stuff. Uh, and I think you will see, and we touched on it a little bit, a lot more collaboration, both within the industry, within countries, and between the national programs and the commercial investors. I think what, what, what you see with you know, Elon Musk sticking a Tesla on top of a rocket, you know, it inspires people, but it shows that he's determined to change the way we think about space and, and to be involved, and that's fantastic. Will, that all sounds like an agenda for you. Well, I, aside from the human aspect of space, which I'm a huge enthusiast for, as is everybody else on this, on this conference call, um, the most important thing I think that's come out of the last few months, the trend line that I see coming, is the fact that we look up at the atmosphere, we look up at the sky, there's no contrails anymore, there's no planes flying. That side of industrialization within the atmosphere is clearly been shown by this huge experiment of the last four months to be shown to have some of the climatic effects. And when you dramatically end it, people feel better about it. I think it's going to hasten the industrialization of space dramatically. I think now the cheaper launch systems for access to space, the ability to use AI to build in space, which is the important thing to do, means that we will start to produce solar power in space and microwave it down to the planet. We will start communicating in new ways using space. We will put our server farms up there because they're very polluting down within this gyre of our atmosphere. 
And I think the events of the last four months will mean that the investment in space increases quite dramatically over a five-year period ahead. And that we will start to have industrial activities up there that we wouldn't have conceived happening in less than 15 years in five. That is be one of the COVID effects will be that. And as for humanity in space, I'm an infinity and beyond person, a final frontier person. And I utterly believe that human beings will get to Mars in my lifetime. And I'm 60. Uh, yeah, and l- I'll let you have the uh, the final wor- word here. You were talking about when space needs a soul. We've heard some uh, pretty inspirational uh, inspirational stuff. What, what are your final thoughts? So I'm the director general of ESA, so I'm not allowed to have a special project. Otherwise, I would be the director special. So you can ask me that question in one year time again. But for me, it's very important that space is not just for the space guys as such. So, for instance, uh, you mentioned the contracts. With space activities, we can reduce contracts of aircraft. So we can do this. So we can reduce also the traffic congestion on Earth. So we can do a lot. We can fight against um, space debris. We can fight against uh, impact of asteroids and so on and so on. So, But for me, the point is really there will be in the future also a parallel of commercialization and and uh, public activities. And we should be more brave in, in uh, Europe also to take the commercial aspects really strongly. And I tried to do so. I tried so also in CV. But what we also find out that um, our c- uh, citizens, we ask them, how much money would you like to spend in space? Not how much are you ready if you are asked to, but how much would you like to spend? And the average value was something like, now I have it only in euro, 280 euros per year per citizen. 280 euros per citizen and year. And what I asked in CV in, in Spain last year was 8 euros per citizen and year. So there is a big potential. And if we use this together with commercial activities, then really Europe can work very well. Well, I'd like to thank all my guests for joining us. Thank you all very much. Uh, Talis Alenia Space UK CEO, Andrew Staniland, CEO of the UK Space Agency, Graham Turnock, Will Whitehorn, President of UK Space, and Jan Werner, Director General of ESA. I'm Richard Hollingham. Thank you very much for attending, for watching. Music.